For those of you that may be new, maybe uh, we have some new people here that don't know who we are. I want to introduce us. We are Mark and Elena Strait. Mark is the executive pastor here at Pathway. He's been on staff for about seven and a half years, almost eight years. Um, I work for an IT company here in Longview. I've been there 12 and a half years. I uh, love being there. I'd probably be there forever. Um, it's such a great company to be a part of. But we love, we both love serving and being a part of Pathway being on the team here, serving in different areas. And then on, Sunday, on days like today where we get to actually serve together and we get to speak together. We love doing this, and it's so much fun. Uh, we have two children. We have Jackson, who is 21. He lives in uh, Dallas. He goes to CFNI, which is Christ for the Nations. It's a Bible school. And then we have Kara. She's 18, and she's a senior. Uh, there they are. And there they are, yep. And she's a senior. She's about to graduate, and so we're going to be in... This last phase of life, we're going to have kids in school anymore. I'm just so grateful I don't have to go any more football games. I mean, I know if y'all left football, but she's I'm a, sad personally, but she's She's not. a cheerleader, and so we had to go to all the games this last year when it was like 120 degrees, and I thought I was going to die. And I was like, thank, thank the Lord that I don't have to do that anymore. I'm so thankful. The little things that we'll, we're thankful for. But this year, we had a big moment in our life. We celebrated 26 years of marriage. Yes, yes. And we just love each other more and more every year as it goes by, uh, love him more and more, and so grateful that God gave me such an amazing God. And I know he feels the same way about me. 100%. Right. I love you more, but it's fine. <laughs> I love you most, so there you go. <laughs> so today, uh, we've been in a relationship series here at Pathway, and I know if you are an OG here, like most of the time, Mark and I talk about marriage, but we're not doing that today. Actually, today we're going to talk about parenting, and we're going to talk about parenthood. We've had a few people uh, come up to us through the years and like, man, I wish you guys would just teach on parenting, teach about parenthood, and never really had the opportunity. And so this Sunday, we were both like, hey, I think this is going to fit here. Let's, let's talk about parenthood. And so when I, when I said that, two reactions probably happened. Either you said, yes, this applies to me. I am so excited. Or you're like, I have, this does not apply to me. Where's the nearest exit? How can I get out of here? Because this does not apply to me. But we believe that this is a topic that fits every age all across the board, and especially what we're going to talk today. Uh, the title of today is Rerouting, Navigating the Seasons of Parenthood uh, and the different phases that we face uh, as parents as we go through life with our kids. Yeah, and the reason we chose that title was, you know, if you've been a parent for a minute, so how many parents do we have in the room? How many future parents do we have in the room? How many have been a kid in their life? Okay. We got. We have nieces, nephews. <laughs> we got it all covered. Yeah, there you go. Um, but we called it rerouting because how many know that about the time you think you have a certain phase or age figured out, it drastically changes, right? And so that's kind of where we're recalculating. So like every year or two, it seems like we're rerouting, we're recalculating, and we're figuring out how to navigate these different seasons. Today, um, I, I would imagine in this room, you've got some parents that you, maybe you've had a day where you feel like, you know what? I nailed the parenting thing. I was a rock star. Anybody ever had that day? Like one of those days, like nailed it, right? All right, how many have had the day where you're like, it's the biggest dumpster fire that ever was, and it got shoved down the street and like ran into a cop car and there was carnage everywhere? All right. <laughs> We've had those too. We've had a lot of those days. So part of part of where I want you to hear our heart coming from is not like we've got this all figured out because we certainly do not. We are not the perfect um, parents. Some of what you'll hear is from our pain and regret. Um, <laughs> and some of what you hear is hopefully from some godly wisdom from our upbringing and what God's shown us in our, uh, our process with our, th our two yeah. kids. But there's three seasons of, of life we're going to address when we're talking about parent-child relationships. The first one is childhood, which is birth to about 12. And you can give or take on that based on how you see it. But just for the, the purposes of our time together today, these are the windows we're going to hit. So childhood, birth through 12, adolescence, about 13 through 19, and then adulthood, 20 and beyond. And then the context for the scripture that we're going to read today is our key text comes from Ephesians chapter 6. And I want to just give you some context for our text. And so that you know, this isn't Mark and Elena trying to grab stuff out of the air and make it work. This is actually where Paul's 
He's talking to the Ephesians specifically. He's talking to them from instruction about how Christian parents and children should relate, um, how, how, what it should look like. And what we see in these three scriptures, as we'll unpack today, is in each three of these, we're going to see each one of these phases of life and parenthood. We're going to see in verse 1 about childhood, verse 2, the teen years, and verse 3, the uh, adulthood. And so why don't we all stand together, and then I'm going to have Elena read our, our text to, uh, together. Yeah, and if you have your Bible, just open it up to Ephesians 6, 1. Here at Pathway, we love to see the paper Bible. I know in technology, we have our technology here today. But if you have, you know, bring your Bible, take notes. But Ephesians 6, 1 uh, through 3 says, Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Honor your father and mother, which is the first commandment with a promise, that it may go well with you and that you may enjoy a long life here on earth. So let's pray. Father God, we just thank you for... Today, we thank you for the freedom and the privilege that we get, to get, we get to have, that we get to come here to worship you and to learn about you. And Lord, I just pray that every heart will be opened, every ear will be open to receive um, what you want to share to them and what you want to impart to them today as we teach. And God, we just love you. We thank you for dying on the cross. We thank you for giving everything for us. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thank you, guys. You can be seated. Thank you for standing for the Word of God. So as I mentioned, we're going to hit these three verses from these three distinct seasons of parenthood and childhood relationship. And so I'm going to kind of overview them for you, the points, and then they all start with T, too. So we're super anointed today. Like, it happened. But we're going to talk about uh, those three verses. So verse 1 Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. This is speaking to the childhood phase of relationship. We're talking about that zero to 12 year window um, where we're doing lots as parents of training. This is the training season. Then in verse two, it speaks to teaching. Honor your father and mother, which is the first commandment with the promise. And we see the promise as we go into the third scripture. But this season is about teaching. It's about teaching our teens and teaching them honor, honor of mom and dad, honor uh, and respect for those in authority. That that season of life is about teaching. Then finally, verse three is about trusting. This is adulthood. Um, so it may be well with you and you may live on, live long on the earth. And how many knows if we're going to live long on the earth, we want it to be well, right? <laughs> so this is a recipe for us and a model for us that talks about these three distinct phases of life and parent-child relationships from children to teens to adults. And so just remember as we go through today that children are trained, teenagers are taught, and adults are trusted. And so with that, we jump into our first point today, which is training. I'm going to open with a little story. Just There's a lot of training that happens in this window um, and how many know that, um, I think they got a picture of our, our kids at that, in that window, but weren't they precious? Just so sweet. Look at those big blue eyes. Mm. We're, we're super biased, but they're mm, the cutest. I love them. Um, they were so little. Um, but with Jackson, I remember when he was about two or three years old, um, he would, he had a little push scooter that he got in as one of his gifts and on a Christmas or a birthday And he would scooch that little thing around the house. And invariably, he'd get into a corner, and then he didn't have reverse. And so he would say, he would holler through the house, Mommy or Daddy, I stucking. I stucking. And so we would go rescue him from the corner. And one particular day, I'd probably done this a half a dozen times, and it dawned on me, I've got to train this kid how to use reverse. (laughs) So I went to the corner with him where he was stuck, and I, I, I taught him how to push off with his feet to where he could, you know, find the reverse on his own. And then ultimately, after that little training session, he didn't get stuck any stucking anymore. But um, we have lots of moments like those in this window. You know, we're we're teaching them how to eat. We're teaching potty training them. Anyone? Anyone? Um, We're training them how to how to function, right, just in in life in general, um, keeping them from the hot stove. We're training them not to burn themselves. 
And so as we look at this, this first verse where it's talking about children, obey your parents, the critical part of that is that we have to be training them and they have to be obeying, right? And so we're going to talk about that through the lens of the Bible, which, by the way, is the best book on parenting that there ever was, um, hands down. So Proverbs 22, 6, said, it kind of speaks to this. Train up a child, and actually that word child uh, in the Greek refers to a, a child in the window of that infant to adolescent range. So it's, we're on firm biblical footing here, but train up a child in the way he should go, and when he is old, he will not depart from it. This is a promise of God that we quote over our kids. And I, I know it's a promise that my parents have prayed over me in my life. But this is, this is a, a, a foundational stone that I want us to build on. We have to train them up. If we train them up, then we can count on the promise. If we don't train them, then it's anybody's guess. And that's, that's certainly not territory we want to be in. Yeah, I know at times, like when I've heard this scripture, I've just kind of glanced or grazed over it, you know, but it is, it's like he said, it's so important. Um, so Mark and I, we, we like to go to the gym. Okay, well, he loves to go to the gym. I go, I'm not sure why yet, but I do go and uh, work out. We work out about four times a week and lift and do all this stuff. And so when I first started going to the gym, um, it was pretty um, intimidating because you walk in and there's all this equipment. You don't know, I didn't know how to use most of it. And um, I'm like, I mean, I know the treadmills and all that kind of stuff, but someone had actually gifted me um, some training sessions and I wasn't going to use them. But then I'm like, you know what, maybe I should use them. And so I met with the trainer and it was amazing because actually what he did was he took me around to all the equipment. He showed me how to use them. He uh, trained me on them. He showed me the muscles like this is what this exercise does. It works this muscle group. It does this. And he went through. And so he was training me how to use the equipment. Because if I would have just walked in there and tried to use it really by myself, um, I probably would have hurt myself in some of the cases because just not knowing the proper form and how to use the equipment. And that's the same way we are with our kids. You know, we have to train them how to do certain things in life so that when they get off on their own, when they're adults, they know how to do these things. They have been trained. We are training them. Yeah, and so think of it this way, uh, especially with the gym analogy, what the trainers are doing are keeping us from hurting ourselves, right? Because I have hurt myself in the gym before because <laughs> I wasn't doing it right. Uh, that's part of what we're doing as parents. We're, we're training them to keep them from hurting themselves severely. They're going to get bumps and bruises and nicks and all those things. Um, and so we're going to come back to kind of a pro-parenting tip kind of in each one of these points. And the first one that's related to this is, and what I want you to get from it is, um, we train a child what to think and what to do. We don't ask them. And in a culture where we're allowing kids to make decisions that are not appropriate for their age, we as parents have to understand our role. We are to train them. They don't know any better. How many know we're born with a fallen nature? By default, we're selfish. By default, we're broken. I can't trust that my kid can figure it out on his own. On, th on matters of his gender, for sure among many other things. And that is an epidemic in our culture that we're trying to allow kids a voice of decision at an age that they're not equipped for it. Their brains are still forming. Matter of fact, you know, into our 20s, really, they're, they're forming, but certainly in that window. And so when you're talking about all of these things that, that need to be trained, um, keep in mind that you're the voice of truth. For your kid, you are the compass. You're setting the target for them, and sometimes setting it and resetting it, and setting it and resetting it. Uh, yeah, if, you, if anything like our kids, maybe yours were perfect. Yeah. But so Ephesians six four says, "And you fathers, do not provoke your children to wrath, but bring them up in the training." and admonition of the Lord. And so it is, you know, scriptural. I mean, to bring them up in the training and admonition of the Lord. So four quick keys to training and discipline your children. These are practical. Um, in this age window, uh, four quick keys. Number one, be clear. With Jackson, we had to be super clear because that little dude had an attention span of a gnat. <laughs> And he was always busy going to the next thing. So with Jackson, what we had to do is, especially for me, I had to get down in his face 
and make sure his eyes were locked on mine. And I would say, Jackson David. And when you invoke the middle name parents, when, you know, that, that's part of the authority structure. Um, I was Mark David. I heard that my whole life. <laughs> Mom and dad are right there. Um, but be clear. Get their attention. Don't be, be conscientious about making sure that they're hearing what's being said and that you're very specific with it. Number two is be convincing. Don't be wishy-washy or inconsistent. You got to be convincing. Don't use empty threats. Uh, that doesn't mean be mean, you know, certainly, but it means be convincing. Let them know that you are. this is what you are saying. This is the law of the land, whatever that may be, and they're to adhere to it. Yeah, my mom was super convincing growing up. <laughs> my mom, she could communicate everything she wanted to tell me by just raising this one eyebrow. <laughs> Like, I don't know if any of y'all have that gift, but, like, she could just look at me and raise an eyebrow. and My I mom did. has that gift. I was like, oh, bless it. I'm about to get in trouble. Like, what did I do? Or when we were in church, my, my mom and dad are pastors, and so I grew up as a pastor's kid. And so my mom, she always sat on the back pew, and, of course, I sat up front with the kids. And if I got a little rambunctious in church because I like to talk, shocker, um, I would hear my mom just go, Psst. And immediately, I knew what it was. Immediately, I was like, I better stop talking. I mean, she didn't even have to do a lot to convince me. Like, I knew she meant business. She was very convincing. Yeah. Anybody got a convincing mom in their life? Yep. A lot of us. So be clear. Be convincing. Be compassionate. Never react, overreact, yell, discipline in anger. Um, let your love for them be the source of of all you say and do. And parents, I tell you this, having been in seasons of my life where it was really difficult, <laughs> okay? Where we were really tired because they didn't sleep or they were sick or they kept doing the same thing over and over again. And there were times I had to apologize to my son, for instance, when I felt like I overreacted out of anger towards him and disciplined him. Parents, be careful because the discipline is about love. It's not about punishment. It's about the priority that we're trying to set in relationship with our kiddos. So be clear, be convincing, be compassionate. Also, just a quick note on that too. Be careful not to discipline in public. Please don't do this. Discipline in private. It's just when our kids, when we were growing up, we took them outside or we took them to a different room. Why? Because that is shaming and it's embarrassing and it's putting them in a, in a super difficult position to be able to receive what you're trying to communicate to them because they're, they're already self-conscious. So our Heavenly Father disciplines us in private, right? Now, sometimes we humiliate ourselves in public. <laughs> I've done that. But he, he disciplines us in private. We should do that in private. So be clear, be convincing, be compassionate, and finally, be consistent, if one time it's wrong and the next time it's not, what you've just done is confuse the heck out of your kid because they're trying to figure out the boundaries. And sometimes, let's just be honest, we, kids can test them because they're trying to see where the weak spots are and the resistance. <laughs> well, I can, get, I can get over on dad with this or I can get over on mom with that. Or I can, you know, be, be unified but be consistent. That requires energy, admittedly. But again, if you're not doing it consistently, what you're creating is confusion because they don't understand, well, this time it was right, but this time it was wrong. In this place, it was okay, but this place, it's not okay. You're, you're clouding their mind. You're, you're going to contribute to your own pain, ultimately, and the struggle of, of your kiddos. Yeah, there was this one time whenever um, Jackson was little. How many of you remember that show on TV called Super Nanny? Does anybody remember that show? It's this show where these families, they had no control over their kids. Like, the kids were going crazy in this show. Like, the parents had no control. They didn't know how to parent. And I started watching this show, and Jackson was in the room with me when I was watching the show. Now, he wasn't necessarily watching the show, but he was in the room, so he was listening, he was hearing. And, um, and so one thing I want to say is be careful what you watch when your kids are in the room with you. Um, some shows, you know, with the language, with um, maybe explicit uh, content, um, regardless, like if your kids are in the room, they pick up more than what you realize. You think they're too young to pick it up, but they really do. They, they can hear and understand. And so I was watching this show, and all of a sudden Jackson had a really big shift in his behavior. Like he started throwing down on the floor, screaming, throwing fits, kicking. And I'm like, what in the world has happened to my child? And I realized that he was mimicking what he was seeing and hearing on TV. 
And so I was like, okay, that's not going to happen in the straight household. We got to nip that in the bud really fast. And um, it took me about three days of consistent discipline with him to break to break that cycle with him and that behavior pattern that he had started. Um, just being consistent with him until finally my Jackson came back and I was like, okay, now let's go. But I had to stay consistent. Every time he did that, I had to discipline him for that behavior because it wasn't the appropriate behavior that, you know, we were trying to train him with in our house. Yeah, we also stopped watching Super Nanny, so. Didn't watch that show anymore. There's that. Um, And talking about discipline, and we're going to spend a lot of time on this because, again, we could spend a series on every one of these points today, but just just if this helps you. Um, in Proverbs chapter 23, verse 13 and 14, and this is the message translation, uh, it says, don't be afraid to correct your young ones. A spanking won't kill them. Uh, I'm living proof of that. Uh, they do, they do not too. kill you. A good spanking, in fact, might save them from something worse than death. And the New King James actually translates that, will deliver their souls from hell. Um, I'm not going to stomp on spanking or not spanking. Uh, I am going to say this is what the Bible says. Um, And you get to kind of figure that out based on how you how you see it in your own discipleship and and, in place with your relationship with your kids. What I can tell you is that when I was little, that that was the thing that got my attention. It was needed because mom and dad, they weren't doing it to be mean to me. They were doing it because my behavior was going to lead to to brokenness, hurt, pain, or death, (laughs) right? Um, When we're talking about spanking, and in our culture right now, it's something that, you know, obviously is a hot-button topic. And so, again, here are our hearts, not just our words. I just, I abide by what the Scripture says. It's the way I was raised. It worked really well, but it has to be done the right way. It's not out of emotion. It's not out of anger. It's certainly not to hurt. Um, it's to correct from a place of love. Matter of fact, you guys may be familiar with the, with the scripture on this. How many have heard the scripture, spare the rod, spoil the child? That's actually not a scripture. That's actually a, a take off of a scripture that is Proverbs 13, 24. What it actually says is, he who spares his rod hates his son. But he who loves him disciplines him promptly. That's strong language. But if I love my son, I discipline him. Um, If I love my daughter, I discipline her. Because ultimately, I'm doing it from a place and a motive of love for them. And when you look at scriptural symbolism, that relationship of sheep and shepherd has a staff and a rod in it. If you'll notice the way that it's taught, and, and if you look at, custom. The rod is not used to beat the sheep. The rod is used to keep the sheep out of trouble or danger. The rod is used if they get too close to the trench or the ditch to keep them out of it. It's used when they're getting starting to wander away from the herd to get them back to the herd. It's used to correct, and the motive is the, is the good shepherd in our case is Jesus, but the motive is always love. It's loving correction because if I ultimately allow that behavior to continue, it's going to cost that sheep, right? It's going to cost my son. It's going to cost my daughter. And so using that, the way you use it is the most important uh, thing to remember. How we discipline through, the way we discipline, the motive we discipline through, it's got to be from love and a heart to to love and to correct. Yeah, when we discipline Jackson and Kara, um, I carried a spoon with me, like a little wooden spatula spoon. I carried it, had one in the car and in my diaper bag. And uh, we had one at home, and that's what we used. And it was never, when we used it on them, it was never, uh, so it was just a pop, maybe a few pops, depending on what it was, you know. Jackson it was, usually got a few more than Kara. Yeah, yeah, Jackson, yes, we love him so much. Um, but uh, he sometimes needed a few more he than He was Kara. here in the first service, and he, he first, loved it. Yeah, he was, <laughs> yeah. Um, but it was, it was never done to bruise or to leave a mark. It was hard enough just to get their attention. And then we also put them in timeout. And with timeout, we used the time method. So if they are two years old, it was two minutes. It was three years old. It was three minutes. Uh, according to their age, there's, you know, if you're trying to make a two-year-old sit in timeout for 10 minutes, I don't know how that's going to work. You'd have to strap them to the chair. But what we did was, according to their age, is the limit of the time. We also, uh, we would take some of their toys away from them. So if they had a favorite toy or something they loved to play with, we would take that away from them, put it up on the shelf, and we would tell them, 
okay, you don't get this for until the next day because of this behavior. Um, and always, even when we discipline them, when we would use a spoon or they would get a swat or a pop on their booty, um, we always sat with them afterwards and loved on them. We would make you know, we'd make them laugh and we would talk with them and we would tell them and show them that, hey, we still love you and it's okay. We're going to get this right. And we still love you. Um, I remember my dad used to do that for me. My dad would spank me. We had a black and white belt growing up and it visited my tushy a lot. And, um, but my dad would always sit with me afterwards and make me laugh. And it always made me so mad because I didn't want to laugh afterwards. But now I realize like why he, why he did that. And he would always say, you know, this hurts me worse than it hurts you. And I'm like, that is a lie. Anybody else ever hear that? That is a lie. It does not hurt you worse than it hurts me. But then when I had to spank Jackson or Kara for the first time, I'm like, oh, this is what he means. Cause it is a hundred percent true. It hurts to do that it ugh. yeah one, one time dad had said the same thing to me and in this season of my life I was having trouble with nosebleeds <laughs> and dad gave me a spanking and my nose started gushing and he and it quickly changed from that to oh my gosh I'm so sorry like are you okay and I'm like oh, I'm fine dad I'm fine <laughs> um but but that was something that dad was always real intentional about and mom too when she did is it was the discipline, but then it was the affirmation. Like, this isn't who you are. This is the consequent for our action. But now we're going to, whether you want to or not, we're going to hug and we're going <laughs> to, we're going to love. And then we're going to go on about our day. Um, the, our heavenly father, by the way, guys, does the same thing for us. Um, Proverbs 3, verse 11 and 12. My son, do not despise the Lord's discipline. And do not resent his rebuke, because the Lord disciplines those he loves. He disciplines those he loves. As a father, the son he delights in. Why does he do that? Because ultimately, we're talking about relationships in this series. Relationship is the goal. Why does he discipline us? Because he wants to draw us closer. He doesn't want us hurt, right? As parents, why do we discipline? Because I want to correct the behavior that might lead them down the wrong path. I want to correct the behavior that might cause them to injure themselves or to lose a limb in an extreme case. But ultimately, the goal, parents, of correction and discipline is relationship. Because I want them to know they're safe with me, that I'm protecting them and taking care of them. So if we could give you some advice for this stage, this is just Mark and Elena's advice of parenting, things that we've learned. Um, The first thing is with your kids, the most important thing that you can do for your children is pray for them, pray with them, and always, always point them to Jesus. That is the most important thing you can do in this age from childhood, from zero birth to 12, is always pray for them. The moment you are... You conceive them. You pray for them. Even before then, while you're carrying them, you pray for them. When they get here, you pray for them. And then when they're here, you start praying with them. You can get their little hands and hold them together, and you pray with them and then point them to Jesus. And we did this a lot of different ways, and you can too, like at meals, before meals. We prayed with our children before they ate, um, before they went to bed. We said our nighttime prayers and had our hugs and kisses uh, before school. We'd pray with the kids, and we would usually maybe sing a little song, or um, and then we would pray for them. And then I'd always tell Jackson and Kara, as they were getting out of the car, be a light today. Be a light. Be a light for someone who needs Jesus today. Okay, mama, as they ran out the door and all that. Uh, the second thing is, advice, is um, start introducing the Bible to them like really early. There are so many different wonderful things out there, but at this age when they're little, there's those little picture Bibles that, you know, show them Jesus, the little pictures they can look. You can read the stories to them, start showing them, you know, who the different characters are in the Bible. There's version has an interactive Bible for kids where they it will read it and they can tap the different things on the screen and it'll pop up and read the story and fun things for them. Uh, also, worship. Begin playing music in your car and in your house, stuff that they love to listen to, words that they can sing, catchy. Now uh, now there's so much more music that's a lot catchy that kids really love. We listened to a lot of VeggieTales growing up with our kids. They loved VeggieTales. Where is my hairbrush, anyone? anyone? <laughs> yes, okay. got VeggieTales. Yes, we listened to a lot of it. That's the only way we could get Jackson to eat his food. The Song of the Cebu was a popular yeah. one uh, yeah. as well. So there's just a lot of things that we could do that um, just our advice for this, for this age for them. So number three is tell them you love them often. 
Um, I don't think you can overdo it. Uh, we over we would try to overdo it in our house. I don't know that we uh, that we do, but it's something that is said a whole lot around our place. And most importantly, that you love them unconditionally. Something that's been a practice of ours since our our kids' earliest um, you know time in our home has been at bedtime specifically, and then even now as they've gotten older, even at just other random times, what they know is, uh, well, we, typically at bedtime it's we love you, big big moon and stars, no matter what. And the no matter what part was super intentional because we wanted them to know from their earliest age that there is nothing they can do that's going to change that. There's no, there's no action they can take. There's no thing they can do. There's no problem they can you know, trip over, no accident they can get in, nothing that will cause mom and dad to feel any differently about them. Also, show them you love them. That's hugs, kisses, high fives, words of praise. And we talked about this a little bit in this series, kind of in our how we speak to males and females and how it's different. It is for kids. We've had both, obviously, a boy and a girl. Boys need more respect and honor talk. They need more, hey, buddy, I'm proud of you. Great job. That's what they need. That's the fuel in their tank. Now, they need to hear dads from you also They lo- that you love them. So not to get that... Um, you know, put that off the table, but that is important, but they need to hear that language of of honor and respect. Girls, my little girl, she needs to hear from me all the time how much I love her Um, and affirm her and value her. All those things are super important. Yeah, another thing that we did um, is we spent spent time with them on their level. I know it's hard when you work all day and sometimes you come home and you're tired, but take time to get on their level. Get in the floor, play with them, get the Legos out, get the crayons and the coloring books out. Spend time uh, on their level. Another thing is we were really um, dedicated to teaching them manners. We wanted to show them, teach them how to use manners and respect. Yes, ma'am. No, ma'am. Yes, sir. No, sir. Thank you, please, all the words that we said. And even when they were even young, I would ask Jackson to do something, and he would go, yeah, and I'd be like, no, yes, ma'am. And he would say, yes, ma'am, and he would repeat after me. And sometimes I had to do that a few times, but I always waited until he responded to me. Or if we were talking to someone, they'd be like, oh, you look so cute, and he would go, you know, I would say, say thank you, and he'd be like, thank you, you know. But it's teaching them, even at a young age, to teach them how to use their manners and to honor and respect those that may be older than they are. Yeah, the next one is parent them individually. Uh, no two kids are alike. And early on in our parenthood journey, we were trying to parent them the same. And let me just tell you, it doesn't work. Because um, you have two individuals that God created very differently and uniquely that respond in different ways, that see the world in different ways. As an example, with Jackson, you had to raise your voice to get his attention. If I raised my voice to my little girl, it would crush her soul. <laughs> we, had, we still do. We have to come to her more softly because um, her personality is wired that way. So my parents, be mindful of that, that you have to figure. It's like a jigsaw puzzle or a Rubik's Cube. Every kid is different. If you have five of them, they're all different. You have to figure out what's in them, what is, what is God's gift in them, how do I steward that? What I'm not trying to do is get them to conform to one style of, of, of kid, you know, kiddom, if you will. We're not trying to get them all to look alike, think alike, do the same things. We've, we've got to understand we're not trying to discipline their identity out of them. They're called to be unique, and, and to our experience, we had to parent Jackson completely differently. We allowed him a lot more room at times to kind of figure that out. But ultimately, it's helped him to grow into who, who God's called him to be. And so um, just be conscientious about that, parents. Parent them intentionally, but also individually. Yeah, and finally, this is like a bonus point on this section, is start saving now for your children because children are expensive. They're so expensive. The older they get, the more expensive they are because as they get older, their clothes get bigger and their shoes and their feet get bigger. And then they want to have phones and iPads. And then, hey, guess what? We're 16. We need to buy them a car. And if you buy them a car, then guess what? They have to have insurance on the car. Insurance costs money. Then they have to have car repairs. And then they have to have car repairs because they back into cement poles at airports. And then, and then, and then all the stuff that goes along with it, then they want to go to college, you have to pay for college and then they want to get married and then you want to pay for that. So start saving now. We debated on where we were going to put this in the, in the message of our advice. I'm like, we have to do it at the beginning because they need to start saving now. We're talking from a little bit of advice. I mean, practice here. What we're saying is hear from the voice of regret. Start saving now. 
Start Start, start early. <laughs> start early. Yes. All right. These next two points go quicker, so don't worry. Uh, the second one is teaching. So we're going to be talking about teaching. So first is training. This season of life, we're talking about teens and adolescents is teaching. And here's our, our little ones in the adolescent window, both of them. Um, and there was a, what came to mind as we were talking about this point was there was, I, I've always had a practice and a habit with Kara of taking her on daddy-daughter dates. And so from her, from, from little bitty, we would do that. It was very intentional because what we were, what I was wanting to instill in her was the, what she should expect from a future relationship, right? So it was about teaching. Um, I'm thinking here. Oh, let me come up here. Um, I felt like, God, you guys are either getting taller. Or I'm, um, but, but with Kara, that was our kind of our habit and tradition that we still do to this day. I take her out, and I wanted to do my part to teach her what she should expect, teach her what she should be looking for in the future. And there's one occasion where it was during a Christmas break, if I remember correctly. Um, she was probably seven or eight maybe at the time, uh, maybe maybe a little older, somewhere in that window. And she came to me, she said, Dad, I want to go spend some of my Christmas money. Can we do a daddy-daughter date? And I, I was not feeling it that day. And I was like, baby, let's just not, you know, let's just, let's just not today. And she said, but Dad, I got a gift card. I want to go to Racket and Jog and get this T-shirt and do this thing. And I said, babe, um, that sounds great, you know, but we don't always get what we want. You know, I'd like to see a unicorn poop and rainbows, but we just don't always get what we want. And so she didn't say anything. She went to her room, and about 30 minutes later, she emerged with a stuffed unicorn that she had in her room, and she had drawn a very elaborate rainbow and colored it and attached it to the back of her unicorn. And, and she was like, can we go now, Dad? And what do you think we did? Right. So um, it's in a million little ways during this season of their lives, guys, we're, we're teaching them. We're teaching them, and sometimes it's bad, and sometimes it's good, but understand that's what this season speaks to. It's verse 2 of our text today. It says, honor your father and mother, which is the first commandment with a promise. And this is one, this season is packed, because we're really only talking about a six or seven year window, but there is a lot happening here. Can I get an amen from anybody that's got experience, right? A lot going on. We've got to teach them to honor their father and mother. Why? Because we want respect? No, because it will serve them well in their lives. And that's what we'll get to in our third point. But it's about honoring our, our moms and dads. It's about honoring those in authority because that's what sets them up to win. Um, Ephesians 6.4 is one verse down from our text says, And you fathers do not provoke your children to wrath, but bring them up in the training and admonition of the Lord. And admonition is just a big word that speaks to instruction, wise counsel, and, and teaching. It, this is where in the adolescent window we have constantly got to be teaching. And we see this in the life of Jesus, actually in Luke chapter 2, verse 46. Kind of cool it says, after three days, they found him in the temple courts, sitting among the teachers. And this is, he's an adolescent during this time, listening to them and asking questions. This really speaks to a couple of things that we wanted to point out. One is when Jesus is uh, spending time in the temple, it's speaking to the priority his family has made of the temple, of church of the place of God, the house of God. It also speaks to, he would have been listening and talking to Pharisees and Sadducees, ultimately people he'd had problems with. Can we admit that? Right, but what was he doing? He was listening to them. He was asking them questions. And then when appropriate, he was answering. But he didn't go in there and blow them up, right? He didn't go, blow, go in there disrespectfully and go, I'm the son of God, y'all sit down, Right? Uh, how many know that struggle in the window of adolescence, because we've all been there, is that we think we know more than we do. And that's not a slight on us or them at that window. It's just that that's where we are in our development. But that, why is it so critical that we teach them this? They've got to be taught so that it will ultimately serve them well in their lives. Deuteronomy 6, 5 through 7 says, And you must love the Lord your God with all of your heart, all of your soul, and all of your strength. And you must commit yourselves wholeheartedly to these commands that I'm giving you today. And this is what I love. It says, repeat them again and again to your children. Talk about them when you are at home and when you are on the road, 
and when you go to bed and when you are getting up. I mean, it's pretty clear how often you are supposed to speak to your kids about Jesus and to teach them about Jesus. So when they're little, you are training them about Jesus, but when they become teenagers, you begin teaching them about Jesus. So it's the whys of our faith. It's the why do we go to church? Why do we read the Bible? Why did Jesus die for us? Why do we accept him as our savior? Why do we get baptized? Like we begin teaching them the whys of their faith, which becomes the foundation of their lives. Yeah, and so kind of as a pro-parenting tip in this point, I remember we train a child what to think and what to do. But when we get to adolescence, we teach an adolescent how to think and how to do. It's a bit, there's a big difference. We don't tell them what to do anymore. We tell them why. And yes, we do have you know, boundaries and we have rules and we have all those things. But can I just tell you that rules without relationship equals death. If it's all rules, because I said so, right? You want to kill your kid's relationship with you? Make it about that. And we've all been guilty of it. I have at times. I've said that. I said so. You know, Jackson, after about the 84,000th question, buddy, I just said so. You know, it's just, you know, I would try to answer the 54 whys proceeding. But, but the point is that if we'll, if we'll be intentional about this season of life, it'll serve us and them well, because this whole series is about relationships. We're talking about parent-child relationships. If the relationship is the point, if it's just getting the behavior, then that, and that's your goal, you may get the behavior, but you'll, ru- you'll ruin the relationship. Does that make sense? If I am just about rules, it's the same with our Heavenly Father and us. If it's all about rules, and the only reason I come to church, or I do anything good, or I give my heart to the Lord, or whatever is all about just doing the rules so that God will be okay with me, then how how many knows that doesn't work over the long haul? It doesn't last. It's got to be about the relationship. That's where it's got to come back to. Yeah, so one of the things that if you have teenagers, in my opinion, one of the scariest things that you have to teach your children is how to drive. I mean, I know some, has anybody have the, like you taught your kids how to drive? Nobody? Oh, if you taught your kids how to drive. It was one of the, it's one of the scariest things that I've had to teach my children. Now, both of them, I taught them both how to drive. Uh, they were with me most of the time uh, because he worked in Longview. And at that time, I was a stay-at-home, you know, well, I worked, but I did the driving back and forth, getting them to and fro to places. But um, when you're putting your 16-year-old, I mean, if you're a 16-year-old, you don't understand this, but as a parent, when you put your child in the seat of a car to drive a huge automobile, It is the scariest thing a parent can do. I was scared for my life. I was scared for the car. I was like, blessed. I hope we have great insurance. Um, They're both really good drivers. But it is because I didn't have the the extra brake on the passenger side to help stop them. It was more like, stop, you know, or gasps or, you know, whatever. But she still does that. I still do that, by the way. But. I do. It's, it's I just fine. learned when I when we're driving to Dallas, I just sit in the back seat now. It's such a more pleasant drive, and I watch a movie or something. Not it, that he's it, a bad it is driver. More pleasant. It he's is. a great driver. It it's is. just me. <laughs> but um, but we had to teach Jackson how to drive, and so one of the things we were going through a neighborhood one day, learning, teaching him how to drive, and we came up to a stop sign, and he was like, "Mom, do I really have to do that? Like, if it says stop, do I really have to do that?" And I'm like, "It is a big red sign that says stop." Yes. You have to do that, Jackson. But it was like, but but why? He's like, sometimes you roll through stop signs. And I'm like, you have to stop. You don't do what I do. You have to stop. But I'm like, because it could save your life. You, Especially now, people are so bad about running red lights. Like, it's completely red, and people are still going through it. I'm like, it could save your life. So, um, you know, just teaching them the driving, that part was really scary. So some advice that we have uh, for this stage, if we give Mark and Elena's advice, um, the first thing is pray for them, pray with them, and always point them to Jesus. This is the most important thing that you can do in this stage of their life. There's a theme developing. I think you're probably going to catch on. Yeah, guess what's going to happen when we get to the adulthood? Y'all can say it with me. But it is. It is the most important thing. The things that our kids face, in the teenage years at school and what they hear at school and what they face at school, you have to pray 
for them, but then you also have to create an environment where you can pray with them so that your teenagers want to come to you so that you can pray with them. And then in all the situations, you always point them to Jesus. And sometimes in, you know, at this stage, you have to talk to your kids about some really, really hard and maybe some uncomfortable topics like the facts of life. That is a topic that can get very uncomfortable to some parents. They don't like talking about the birds and the bees. Um, but, it, but it's a topic that we really have to, we have to, as parents, teach our kids about. Well, and kind of in the, the, the subject of open communication, establishing open communication with our kids, that was the one that came to mind for us, uh, especially with Jackson. And we're kind of picking on him today because he, he doesn't mind it, honestly. He just has a lot more stories um, than Kara. Yeah. He's just so calm. He created more stories for us. Uh, that's right. kind of the way it went. But when I took him away, for, and we, we both did this for both of our kids, and I think it's really important to kind of state this. It's critical for your kids, for you as parents, to draw a line of demarcation in these seasonal shifts in their life so they understand what's going on, right? So with whether you know, you know, you mark it with, a weekend where you're talking about all the things or a moment or you're taking them out, you know, for, for a burger or whatever. The point is help them understand when things are shifting in their life and when the responsibilities are changing and when they're given more responsibility for all the things that are going on on their side of the equation. So for us, we did it by taking them out of town and doing an activity with them. With Jackson, I just finished explaining the birds and the bees to him. And he sat there for a few seconds processing. I could see, like, the wheels were turning. And after a few moments, he looked at me and said, So, Dad, you and Mom have done this twice? (laughs) And I said, At least. (laughs) At least. (laughs) But kind of case in point, you know, when you're you're teaching, you want to be the source of information. You want to be the minister of truth for your family, right? What you don't want is for them to learn about those things elsewhere because it's kind of, I've heard it referred to as the law of first mention. If they hear it from you first, they're much more likely to come back to you. If they hear it from the locker room, they're more likely to go to the locker room. If they hear it from the TV or the internet, they're more likely to go find it at the internet. And but that with, won't be the truth. Right. But with, with both of our kids, and, and we've gotten a lot of things wrong, but this is one that I feel like we got pretty right. And it served us well all the way up to at least this point with both of them. When they hit hard stuff, especially around the subject of sex and those kinds of the deeper issues, we're the first conversation. Because they'll go, hey, I heard, I heard this today. What is that? Or I heard that clarification. Some of the, the conversations that your kids are exposed to would make you blush. But you want to be that source for them. And when you do, you set yourself up to be the teacher instead of constantly playing catch up with culture. Yeah, and I mean, when you're having these conversations with your kids about the facts of life, the birds and the bees, don't make it awkward. I know it's really hard sometimes for us parents to talk about your kids about, you know, sex and these kind of things. But, you know, Jackson and I, um, I mean, Mark and I, um, we did not want to make that awkward. It, it, inside, I felt awkward. Inside, I was going, oh my God, I can't believe I'm talking to my kids about this, inside. But on the outside, I was like, this is, this, is, this is the way it is. This is the facts. This is the truth. And this is what we want you to learn through this. Because if you make it awkward, it's going to make it harder for them to come back to you later on to ask those questions because you made it awkward and uncomfortable. So when you face these issues and these topics or whatever they're struggling with, always make it just a matter of fact. Like, okay, let's talk about this. Let's explore. Let's, let me hear you. And then I want you to hear me. And then let's talk about this. And then make a decision, an educated decision uh, about it. So just to be and being open and honest with them about everything, um, it always brings them back to us. And just all I want to add to that is, especially when you're talking about the subject of sex, use biological language with your kiddos because that's what they're hearing. And if you call if you color it a different way, and it, it can bring confusion and it can cause them to not trust you, which is kind of part of the point. Yeah, and the third thing, um, we got to speed up, babe. We're like way behind. 
Right. But number three I'll, is... I'll talk at times too. I'm I know, I know. Number three is make church a priority. So teenage years, make church a priority. Uh, we taught our kids early on to love the house of the Lord, to love coming here. Whenever we would come to church, we would set the example, like we get to go to church today. We get to go worship and we get to go hear about Jesus. And we always made it this fun and exciting thing. It was never like, oh, we got to go to church today. Do we have to go? It was never that. It was always exciting for us to take our kids to the house of the Lord. And even now, like Jackson and Kara, love coming to church. They love coming to students. They'll take off work if something exciting, you know, if there's something that interferes with their Wednesday night service. They are here. They love the house of the Lord. And that just makes us so proud that they love to be here. They Both of them serve. They love to serve. Jackson's serving in a church uh, in Forney now. And um, we're just, you know, they are both so passionate about Jesus. And that really just, it makes us so happy. Yeah, um... I had a drug problem when I was young. I got drugged to church every time the doors were open. Your um, mom's heart probably just sank just then. <laughs> now she knows it's true, but but I don't I don't regret it because um, there were times, and I'm sure our kids have had times where they didn't necessarily want to go, but it wasn't their choice um, because it was mine. I wanted them in the house of God. I wanted them to learn the things of God, be around the people of God. You know, with my with my mom and dad, you know, if I said I wasn't feeling well, they'd say, great, let's get in the car, we'll go up there, we'll nunch with hole, we'll pray for you, and you'll be healed. Um, uh, and I just want to speak to this because it's an issue that we're seeing, especially in student ministry, but just in general in our culture, where we're allowing kids to make these decisions. Guys, don't do it. It's not their decision, all right? Uh, and and if, it's, if this is any of you, I'm sorry, but I just, I just want to kind of mention it very graciously. If you're using keeping your kids home from students as a punishment, please don't do that. Please don't do that. If anything, they need to be in the house of God to hear the word of God. Uh, that was a kind of a, a subject I talked with Pastor Jada and Kayla about recently that, that they've seen more often. It, that's, that, or, you know, sometimes it's an excuse, you know, for, for the kid. But, but ultimately, we want to make sure that we're giving uh, these kids the, the best opportunity to, to learn and to grow in the house of God. That's why it's so important to us. We've seen the fruit of it, uh, and you know, certainly in our kids. So four quick keys to relating to your teens, and we'll kind of close out uh, this, this section. Um, this is from Dr. James Townsend, so if you've heard it before, but I just want to give you these four really quickly. Number one, keys to relating to your teens. Number one, love. It's got to start with love. If it doesn't start with love, start over. Uh, convey love, care, compassion for them often, and listen. Listen a lot. They have a lot to say, but if you don't listen to them, they'll stop talking to you. Uh, number two is truth. Make your house rules clear. Not emotional, but clear. And be consistent with consequences that are applicable with whatever those, those rules are. Love and truth. Then be willing to give them a measure of freedom. You've got to let the rope out. You've got to let them try their wings. Um, this is a stage of life where they can disobey if they choose. It's our job as parents to communicate, well, if you do, this is the consequence. Like when Jackson was, was going through curfew that season, if you're late, you've got to be home 30 minutes earlier the next time. And it wasn't, it wasn't a mean, you know, anger conversation. It was just, well, you got here late. You made the choice to come in earlier next time. And if he did it again, it was another half an hour until he was never leaving. But, um, but, Give them freedom, but within safe boundaries. And finally, reality. So love, truth, freedom, reality. The world is going to bring reality to your children. I would rather they find some reality underneath my care and supervision than I would out on their own. So let them experience it in a safe place, and then, but then follow through with the consequences or what's required to love them and lovingly discipline them as necessary so as to help them and to nurture them. Yeah. So that brings us to point three, which is trusting. This one's going to go really fast. I know you're probably like, well, but it's, it goes really fast. But it's uh, they enter into the adulthood phase uh, but when they're 20 years old or older, and um, it's trusting. This part uh, is new for Mark and I. So we are here's Jackson and Kara as adults. Aren't they precious? They just grew up so beautifully, didn't they? I just love them so much. Thank you for humoring us. Yes. 
Yes, they're so pretty. Anyway, um, but this is a whole new phase for Mark and I. We're stepping into two children who are, they're not children anymore. They are adults. And so now we've completed the training and the teaching, and now they are adults. And this is a part where we are going to start trusting them uh, with their life and to make their decisions. Uh, if we've done really good training them and if we've done really good teaching them, then it's not going to be hard trusting them because we've done what we should have done to get them to this point, and so we can let them go. Now, in the book of Elena, this is just me. It said, you know, for me, training and teaching can be more physical and spiritual part of parenting. When we get to adulthood, it's more emotional and spiritual. Spiritual is definitely a part of both, but one, when they're little, it's more physical. There's a lot more involved. But when they get to this age, it's a lot more emotional. It's a lot more of um, letting go because as parents, we've had control basically over their lives up until this point. And now once they reach adulthood, we really don't have any control over their decisions anymore. They have to make their own decisions and they get to face the consequences of those decisions, whether they're good or whether they are bad. And um, that's really hard on parents. I, you know, I was like, oh, this is harder. This is hard when you get adult kids because you can only give them advice and you can lead them, but they make their own decisions. Yeah, and parents, you want you want to do that. You want to make that transition. Uh, it's kind of like the, the driving example um, as it relates to trusting in this transition that's happening between adolescence and adulthood. Um, when they first got their license, they only drove to school and back, which for us is literally less than a mile. It's like <laughs> around the corner. As they prove they can handle that, we would let the rope out a little more. They could go down to the grocery store and back. They could go to a friend's house that lived close by and back. And then ultimately, they, we, we let the rope out to where they could drive to students on Wednesdays, which was for us about a 25-minute drive from where we live. Uh, but the point is, it's a gradual process of trust. But as, as Elena was kind of saying, it, there's a point where you have to let go of the rope. And that's the trust part. And guess what? It's going to be scary. And guess what? You're not going to have all the answers. And you're going to want to do things for them. And you're going to want to try to fix it or whatever. And that's not the season you're in. You're in the trust season. Your role has drastically shifted. And we're going to talk about that a little more as we go through this point in conclusion. But coming back to our key scripture, this is from Ephesians 6, 3. And it says, so it may be well with you and you may live long on the earth. And this is the payoff, guys, if we have trained well and we have taught well. If we train well, we teach well, then we can trust well and it will be well with you. Right? That's, part, that's the blessing of parenthood if we do it God's way. And just remember, as a quick reminder, children are trained, teenagers are taught, taught adults are trusted. And this is the stage where the training wheels literally come off, like they're out there on their own. Um, there's a couple of places in the Bible, I won't read the scriptures, I'll just refer to them, but in Exodus 30, uh, it's noted there that at 20 years old, you began paying your own temple tax. Uh, in Numbers chapter 1, when Aaron and the, children, the men of Israel were getting ready for war, if you were 20, you were going to war. And so the Bible kind of speaks to that roughly 20-year-old window as the marker um, that we're, 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 you know, the clinical term is de-parenting. We're, we're letting go of the parental relationship, which is hard, right, guys that have done it? It's hard, but necessary, because we've got to let them find their, their way, We've done all the teaching and training we can do at that point. It's, it's up to them. And so remember, kind of in our pro-parenting tip, we train a child what to think and what to do. We teach an adolescent how to think and how to do it. But in trusting, we trust them to do it. And we pray. And we be available. And that is probably the harder thing of, of the three. Oh, for sure. I mean, so if advice that we can give you for this stage in life when they are reaching adulthood guess what number one is? Pray for them, pray with them, and point them to Jesus, because that's what you do at this point. You pray. When I say you pray for your adult children, especially at the beginning, and even through their adulthood life, there is no prayer like the prayer of a mother and a father. It is the most 
powerful prayers that you pray over your children, that they would love the Lord, that they would know the Lord, that they would follow him and they would be, you know, do what he is asking them to do. Like this is those prayers that happen from adulthood. This is what we're praying for Jackson and Kara, that God would just be with them and cover them. It's a whole nother realm of like a deep prayer that you pray uh, for your kids at this age uh, in adulthood. Yeah, be ready to give advice, but take on a mentorship type role. And that is hard to digest if you're a parent, but that's where you're at. When you get to adulthood, my relationship with Jackson, he'll be 22 this year. It's more of a friendship role. And let me tell you, just as a side note here, that's where it's okay to be friends with your kids. It is not okay or appropriate to be friends with your kids at the other ages. That doesn't mean you don't relate to them or do things together, but you're teaching and training. You're teaching and training. When they get to this stage where, again, where Jack's not, he'll text me about, you know, the Mavis game or he'll call me or FaceTime me, usually at very inconvenient times, but I always take the call. <laughs> and usually it's to share something with me that he thought was funny. It's, it's not much anymore about, Dad, I need you to tell me what to do, Right. That's not my role anymore. Matter of fact, there was one time early in his adulthood transition where he's like, Dad, just tell me what to do. I said, not my job. I can tell you what I think. I can tell you what I might do if I was in your spot. But ultimately, you need to hear the voice of the Lord for yourself. And then whatever he says is what you do, and your mom and I will support you. Um, critical, critical, critical. This role changes drastically. It's mentorship and friendship. Um, just a couple of words of caution for parents. Do not try to control or manipulate your adult children. Um, you say, you know, saying things like, do you know how many hours I was in labor with you? <laughs> you know, um, you know how many gray hairs you gave me? <laughs> yeah, that's mine. But if you try to control and manipulate, all you're going to do is drive them farther from you. Um, if your kids don't take your advice, parents, that's not disrespecting you. That's them trying to find their own way. Now, maybe it was good advice. What I've learned is I hold my advice because they usually trip onto the right thing if I don't say it, <laughs> right? But just remember that. Then secondly, what it indicates too sometimes it's, that comes to the surface during this window transition is that um, you, don't, you haven't established a strong trust relationship, and so that's where separation occurs. That doesn't mean it can't be reestablished, but it is a reminder and reinforcement that as you go through training and teaching, that that trust relationship is solid. I'm the source of information. I'm there for you. I'm loving on you. I'm guiding you. I'm teaching you. I'm training you so that when they get out on their own, they know that they can trust where they can come back to. Um, we always made a place for Jackson and Kara to do that. It's something that since their earliest years, we weren't afraid to have hard conversations with them, but we were always there no matter what the thing was um, and giving them that safe place. Uh, give them the freedom to learn their own lessons, um, to live their own life, and then be available. Adulthood is where our children can be of friends, and that, that will mature over time, um, but not before. Yeah, when I was, you know, I've stressed so much about the, the importance of prayer. Uh, just a quick story. When I was about 21 years old, I went to Bible school in Oklahoma, and I was there for about a year. And while I was there, I started dating this guy, and he went to Bible school, and I thought, you know, hey, this is a good guy. He's going to Bible school. He loves Jesus. And um, But the guy turned out to be uh, emotionally and physically abusive to me. And, you know, I was raised in a good home. I had a dad who loved me and showed me, you know, how a man should treat his wife. And, you know, I knew, I knew what to look for. But it was kind of like I just had, the only way I can explain it is like I had these scales over my eyes and I really couldn't see who he really was. So my mom and dad came up to see us. And later on, they didn't tell me this right away, but when they were on the way back home, my dad said that my mother cried the whole way home. He said, she cried so hard, I had to pull over the car on the side to help her get control because she knew that he wasn't the one that God had for me and that he was not right. And uh, But they didn't tell me that at the time. They didn't tell me all this till after it was over. But um, And so probably a few weeks later, I came home. And when I walked, and from that point on, my mom and dad prayed. Like they were on their knees praying for me. 
And when we, I brought him home, and when we walked into my parents' house, it literally was like the scales, like you hear and see in the Bible, like the scales came off my eyes, because, and I really saw him for who and what he was and what he had done to me. But it was because of the prayer that my parents invested in me in their home that when I walked into that home where that prayer and that covering was, it changed my life. It transformed. It had that much power that it did that. And so as parents, when you pray and you pray over your children these things, your, pray, your prayers have power that can change literally their lives. Yeah, and if you've been here for a minute, you've heard me relay this before, but if you're new, you know, I had a season after high school where I got away from the Lord for a few years. And what I can tell you is as difficult as I know that was for my parents, what they didn't do was go put their finger in my face and, and tell me what I should do or shouldn't do. They told me they were disappointed. They told me they were concerned. Um, but mostly what they did was pray. And pray they did and anoint they did. And if you've heard me tell this before, they would anoint our bedposts and our door frames and our car stereos and anything they could anoint was anointed. Um, and Marty and I's joke was when we, you know, come home, we'd open the front door and we would just slide all the way to the back of the house. Um, but let me just tell you kind of to Elena's point, the prayer worked because, and the scripture is true. You train up a child in the way they should go. And when they're old, they will not depart from it. doesn't mean they're not going to have trouble in the middle. doesn't mean they're not going to have struggles, but it's a promise of God. We pray over our kids. They haven't left the faith, but I'm praying it preventatively and proactively, um, and, and also knowing that if they did struggle, God's got them. And for us, that's that's a huge part of the priority that we place on Jackson and Kara is, is making that place of prayer for them on a regular basis over the different changing issues of life that they go through. I was on the phone with Jackson the other day, and he had called me, and he was wanting some, you know, advice and was talking to me about life and advice. And I was listening, and I was talking to him. And, um, and I just stopped him and I said, Jackson, I said, thank you so much for letting me be a part of your life. Thank you so much for including me, for coming to me, for talking to me. And he said, and this is what he said, and it was so powerful. It almost made me want to start bawling my eyes out. But he said, mom, if I didn't trust you, I wouldn't run to you. He said, I run to you because I trust you. And I was like, Oh my gosh. And I'm like, let me write this down, Jackson. This is so good. <laughs> but that's, that's the goal. That's the goal. I want them to run to us because they trust us. Yeah. So in closing, guys, these three seasons are, they have their own challenges. They're all unique. But God's roadmap for us, hopefully you've heard from us today, is, is pretty clear. In that childhood phase, we're training in the adolescent phase, we're teaching them. In the adulthood phase, we're trusting them. And ultimately, they're trusting us. And so if you guys will stand, we'll close out with, with a little prayer. And the worship, or worship team, but prayer team, you can go ahead and come down. The worship team is up here, Josh. Thank you. I want to share this as we close because um, I felt like from the Holy Spirit when we were praying yesterday over you, this, this is what came to the surface for me. But here a couple of weeks ago, so if you don't know, we mentioned it, but our son Jackson went away to Bible school in this past fall, and it was a big change for him. So his church home changed, his friend circle changed, his city changed, to being in Dallas, everything changed. And so it's been challenging for him in a lot of ways, spiritually as well as financially and all the things. And so here a couple of weeks ago, he'd gone through a couple of really tough weeks in regards to all that. And I was, I went on a prayer walk and I told Lana, I said, I'm going to go pray about it and see what God says. And so I'm praying and how many have ever been guilty of like bringing stuff up to God that you think he doesn't know about or <laughs> maybe remember? I was doing that and I was just about the end of my walk and I was praying over all the things. And what I heard so crystal clear that I want you guys to hear for yourselves, maybe for your families, for your kids. He said, Mark, he's my son too. Trust me, I will not let him fail. And that's his heart for us. You think about how good of a parent or how much we love our kids and what we would do for them. No, they have a heavenly father that loves them more. They have a heavenly father that's working harder than we are behind the scenes, touching them, 
being there for them, loving them, protecting them. And so if you'll bow your head, I just kind of want to pray that over you. Holy Spirit, I just thank you for that word. And I think you're reminding all of us here today that we're your kids too. And that our kids and our grandkids are your kids. And so if there's anybody here, Father, that's that struggled as, as we have in the different seasons of life, I pray that today they would not feel condemnation or shame or anything like that from you. But they would hear a voice of truth and of hope and of healing, knowing that wherever they are in this spectrum, they can begin today rest, restoring and bringing health and wholeness and healing to those relationships. So Father, we just take this moment to receive your love, the love of a good, good heavenly Father. And we thank you that you're always working, even in the spaces we can't see it. And specifically, I want to pray over any parent-child relationships this morning that are broken. If there's distance, if there's a disconnect, Lord, you're a miracle worker. And so we pray by your power over all of these relationships that you bring supernaturally healing, that you bring a supernatural intervention that only you could uh, take care of, that only you could do, to bring them together, to, to begin the process of restoring communication, restoring relationship, and rebuilding trust. We commit that to you in Jesus' name. And we all said, amen. Amen. Can you give God a praise for his word today? Hey, Pastor Marty here from Pathway Church. And I just want to say thank you for joining us. And I want to encourage you to get connected and stay connected. And there's several ways you can do that. Number one, you can download the Pathway app and we are all the time offering resources and information on that app for you. You can also subscribe to our YouTube channel. And if you do, make sure you click the bell so that you never miss any life-giving and life-changing content as we add it to the channel. And then also, uh, make sure you follow us on social media, on Instagram, on Facebook. Look, our hope and heart for you is that you walk in the purpose for which God made and created and redeemed you for. We love to connect people to purpose. We thank you for giving us this opportunity. And if you're ever in Longview or you are in Longview, I'd love to invite you to join us in person each weekend. Listen, I pray God's best for your life. I believe if you follow Jesus, your best is ahead.